Good evening, folks. We're just letting people trickle in for a little while. Um, once we hit a good number here, we'll get started, probably a little bit after the hour. Okay, as folks trickle in, I just want to say welcome, and we're just going to give it a couple more minutes to let folks filter in, and we'll get started. People are still trickling in, so we might give it till about 6.03, and then we'll get started tonight. All right, folks, I have 6.03 and we're getting pretty filled up here. So I wanted to say welcome and good evening to everyone. My name is Brian Straniti and I'm the Outreach and Engagement Manager with the Duchess Land Conservancy. First off, I wanna thank you all for joining us for our second webinar in our Earth Matters series this evening. Uh, we are very excited for our guest presenter, Doug Tallamy. But first we're gonna go over some basic information about tonight's webinar. First, this session is being recorded. Second, you are muted to ensure that there is no interruption during the presentation. Third, the raise hand function is disabled and all questions should be answered into the Q&A box. Uh, you can submit questions at any point during the presentation by accessing the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And all the questions will be addressed when our presenter has finished or potentially answered by our team during the presentation. Uh, fourth, the chat is disabled. Fifth, closed captioning is enabled for this event, and to turn on this function, go down to the closed caption icon located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and finally, I'm going to hand the mic over to Julie Hart, uh, our Senior Manager of Stewardship and Education, who will tell you a bit about the Duchess Land Conservancy, this webinar series, and our guest presenter. Julie. Thank you, Brian. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Julie Hart, an ecologist and educator here at the Duchess Land Conservancy. Many of you are probably familiar with the DLC, but for anyone who's not, let me just give you a quick overview. The Duchess Land Conservancy is a private nonprofit land conservation organization located in the Hudson Valley area of New York State. And we're dedicated to preserving the farms, forests, wetlands and waterways, open spaces and wildlife habitats of Dutchess County. We are an accredited land trust. And since our founding in 1985, we have worked with hundreds of landowners and protected over 44,000 acres of land. We're so excited that you can be here with us for our first season of Earth Matters, the DLC's new winter webinar series, which happens on the first Wednesday of each month from November through April. This year's webinars consider the question of how we can improve habitat around our homes to support wildlife. Our expert speakers will discuss topics related to native and invasive plants and the role they play in the lives of insects, birds, pollinators, and other wildlife. We hope you'll be inspired to learn how we, as stewards of the land, can make choices that will make our own landscapes more ecologically friendly to all of the species that call it home. Many thanks to our sponsors, Houlihan Lawrence and the Molly B. Schaefer Education Fund, 
And I want to give a special shout out to Lisa Lot Vince, the DLC's wonderful volunteer. Without her dedication and enthusiasm, these programs would not have been possible. So let's get started. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Doug Tallamy as our speaker. Doug is an entomologist and a professor of agricultural and natural resources in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has taught insect-related courses for 40 years. Doug's research seeks to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. In addition to his numerous scientific publications, he's also written several books, including Bringing Nature Home, The Living Landscape, The Nature of Oaks, and Nature's Best Hope, which is a New York Times bestseller and the focus of tonight's webinar. I haven't read all of Doug's books yet, but I have found them to be real eye-openers. He has a real knack for explaining complex concepts in ways that we can easily understand and giving us ways to put that, those ideas into practice ourselves. And with that, I'll turn it over to Doug to teach us more about nature's best hope. Well, thank you very much, Julie. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, before I, I talk about what my idea of nature's best hope is, I want to talk about Edward O. Wilson's idea of how to save life on planet Earth. Uh, most people know about E.O. Wilson. He's Professor Emeritus at Harvard at this point, but he's had a very long career, one of the most impactful biologists of all times, but certainly of our time. He writes a book a year, uh, and even though he's 92, still writing a book a year, but this is the one he wrote in 2016 called Half Earth, Our Planets Fight for Life. Uh, and his, his message was clear that in order to save life on planet Earth, we're going to have to save functional ecosystem. We're going to have to save nature on at least half of the planet. And he spends most of the book talking about the science that supports that, that claim. Well, the conservation biologist, that sounds great. Let's, let's just put half of the earth aside for nature. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're scratching our heads. How can this be possible? Half of planet earth is already in, uh, terrestrial earth is in some form of agriculture and almost 8 billion of us are in the other half with all of our roads and airports and detritus. And we don't have a third half to put aside for, for nature. So um, not sure how that can be. What I wanna talk about today, tonight, is that uh, I do think we can, we can realize EO's dream of saving half the earth, but we're gonna need a new approach to conservation in order to do that. I don't know if you remember in 2019, uh, in the fall of 2019, we had what we call an oak mast members of the Red Oak group got together and all decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it uh, and I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn, first it chewed a little hole for its head, forced its head through there. Then it forced its entire body through that hole. It was a tight squeeze, looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped down and very dangerous time for this insect larva because it is good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions uh, and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa and then stays there for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are at the end of that extension. They take those mouth parts to a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in it, and that's how the larva gets down there. Why do they spend two years underground instead of coming out the next year as most insects would? Because red oak acorns take 18 months to complete their development. And if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, once they leave the acorn, they leave a hole. It's a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils when they leave acorns. And if scouts find a new acorn with a hole in it, they get all excited because their old acorn's falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the, the eggs, the entire colony moves into the new acorn in about 30 minutes. And then they post a guard here to make sure nobody else comes in. And this is where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn disintegrates. What's my point? Uh, it's very simple. That is, that is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions, largely between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of, of oak acorns. 
the fly about a mile from the tree after they take an acorn and then bury it beneath the ground. And that's what they're gonna eat during the, the winter time. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So they're actually planting, for every four acorns, they're planting three new egg, uh, oak trees every single year. Uh, the relationship between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. Uh, that's what they feed their, their young. They rear their young on carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have lots of carpenter ants, and you won't have lots of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have this plant, Facilia. That is the only uh, pollen that that particular bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees, and over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. You won't have the balter or checker, checker spot unless you have uh, um, white turtle head. Uh, I could talk all, all night long about nature specialized relationships, but my point here is that many of these relationships, nature itself, are on the ropes at this point. <clears throat> and nature's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, he looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave it as, as it was. Uh, there's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. We got 770 million acres of rangeland in this country, that's, that's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. Of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies, uh, changed our climate for centuries to come. We have drained our aquifers. We have introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other such remnants to sustain the amount of nature that we humans need to run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done this? I don't know. Uh, but I suspect that we thought the earth, our nest, was so large we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that and uh, we're, we're starting to hear about that. Major news outlets like this one, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline, followed by this headline, North America's lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's almost a third of our North American bird population already gone. In fact, the UN now predicts that we're going to lose a million species to extinction, possibly within the next 20 years. I don't know if you heard three, four weeks ago, we actually removed 23 species from the endangered species list, not because we saved them, but because they're already extinct. Uh, so here's the prediction, but uh, I'm telling you, this is not an option. We cannot allow this to happen if we want to stay happy on this planet. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment thus upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if planet earth lost insects, and he did it way back in 1987, with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants uh, disappeared, that would, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial uh, habitats, ecosystems, that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, those food webs would collapse and all those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is, is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here and that is none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. And we're gonna to have to change the way we landscape 
pretty soon. Why is that? Well, you know, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on, on the life support systems that ecosystems deliver us. We call them ecosystem service services. Here are a few things that, that plants uh, do. We, we always talk about them making these products for us. It's actually for everything on the planet, not just us. Producing oxygen, we all need that. Clean water, slowing the journey of this water after it rains to the sea where it's too salty to, to use. Carbon capture, enormously important ecosystem service these days. Pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of arm's way, building their tissues out of the carbon, and then pumping the extra carbon into the ground. Our soils are, are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the, uh, the eons. Plants are building topsoil. They're holding it in place. They're preventing floods. They're dampening severe weather, converting sunlight to food. If we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight, and that will be a challenge. What are animals doing for plants? They're providing pest control services. They're pollinating nearly 90% of our flowering plants, dispersing plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroys the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but now it's a, it's a downright terrible idea because we need more ecosystem services today than ever before. We've got more people on the planet. Again, almost 8 billion people on the planet, taking huge areas of the planet out of production for, for, service, for uses like a, a status symbol. Just not a good idea. Now, there have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with, with planet Earth. And Elder Leopold was, was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. And one of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been indigenous groups that have been very good at doing that for long periods. But our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another area, doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Leopold had uh, a lot of faith in humans. He believed we could develop what, what he called a land ethic. Uh, he, he knew we had to use the earth. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he believed we could learn to do it gently enough without destroying local ecosystems. And that's what he called the land ethic. He wrote about it in the same county almanac. What he did not write about was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. Uh, and I'm not sure why that was, but um, I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, it's still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. What I want to argue this evening, though, is that not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We need to save nature, actually rebuild it in all the places we've, we've dismantled it, where there are a lot of people, because that's almost everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every year, but thrive. Where should we start? Let's go back to private property. Most of the country is privately owned. And if we don't do conservation on private property, we're gonna fail. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 98% of Texas is privately owned. 78% of the entire country privately owned. We have to use these places uh, to do conservation because conservation obviously is not working in our parks and preserves. So we now need to, to do conservation outside of those parks and preserves on private property. Now, when I talk about conservation, I'm not using the word correctly. We do want to conserve any parts of nature that are left. And I know in New York State, you've got some pretty nice places up there, but in an awful lot of, of places, most of, of the natural world is gone. So what we need to do is rebuild it. We need to reconstruct it. It won't be exactly like it was before we dismantled it, but we can create functional ecosystems by reuniting enough of those specialized interactions I talked about in the beginning uh, so that you have uh, a, a functioning ecosystem. But it's important to recognize that not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the building blocks, the ones that are most important. And that includes two groups, the flowering plants, and the pollinators that allow those plants to, to reproduce, um, those plants are capturing the energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, turning it into food 
storing it in their parts. So now we have energy from the sun as food and plant parts. We have to get it to animals. Most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate plants, insects for the most part. Uh, and it turns out that caterpillars are essential in terms of delivering food to most animals. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. <clears throat> so if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we've got a failed food web and a failed ecosystem. Let me use the Carolina chickadee as an example. That's the chickadee you have down uh, where I live in Southeast Pennsylvania. You've got the black cat chickadee, practically the same bird doing the same thing. That's the bird that is at your feeder uh, in, in the fall and all winter long eating seeds. And we tend to think that's what chickadees need. Well, 50% of their diet in the wintertime is seeds. The other 50% is insects and spiders, even in the wintertime. But when they're reproducing in the spring, their babies can't eat seeds. So they switch entirely to insects and uh, in a healthy environment, they will rear their young almost exclusively on caterpillars. And chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, there's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is a citizen science project that one of my students did a few years ago, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call to bird photographers to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they were carrying food to the nest. And the object was to identify what the, the prey items in the beaks of these, these birds were and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of birds in North America as possible. Uh, she got thousands of pictures, did a lot of, of uh, identifying. Uh, and this is a summary of her results for the 20 most common bird families. The green bars are the percentage of the nestling diets in these, these families of birds that were caterpillars. Uh, and in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, what would happen, particularly during the breeding season to our birds, if we didn't have enough caterpillars in the landscapes? Most of them would not be able to read. So there's something special about caterpillars. There's a lot of other insects out there. Why are birds focusing on caterpillars? There's actually several, th several things uh, special about them. One of them is that caterpillars are soft. So think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The sausage is his, his uh, exoskeleton. It's his cuticle made of chitin. It's undigestible. And the birds don't want a lot of that. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of, of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, <clears throat> they're pretty rough. They just stuff it down there. It's like a, like a plunger. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other types of insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. They have very thick exoskeletons. And many beetles have really sharp edges too. Then finally, caterpillars turn out to be the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now I mentioned carotenoids, um, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? From what they eat, of course, but uh, look at bird prey items here. Carotenoid content is not equally distributed. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. Uh, the carotenoids are in the green leaves of, of the plant. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and, and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They are essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. How many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Let's go back to, to uh, chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands of caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest. 
depending on the number of, of uh, birds in the nest, the number of chicks in the nest, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get chickadees to the point where they fledge. And after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days. They're flying all around, so nobody's been able to count them. But you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to get one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce through to independence. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you do, because in so many places, that's all we have is our yards. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because the chickadees are only foraging about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we don't landscape in a way that makes all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of bird declines. We went to the original data set of, of Rosenberg et al. Uh, that's the Smithsonian group that said we have lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided terrestrial bird species into two groups. The species that do not require insects when they're reproducing. So things like uh, doves and finches that actually can make a little milk out of seeds and feed that to their young versus the birds that do require insects when they're, they're reproducing. Uh, and what we found is that the birds that don't require any insects didn't lose any numbers during the last 50 years, but the birds that do require them lost on average 10 million individuals per species. Doesn't prove cause and effect between the amount of insects and bird, bird uh, survivorship, but it does strongly suggest that as you take bird food away, you lose the birds. So a new goal for a landscape, and we certainly might want to consider, is creating landscapes that, that do house large populations of insects, particularly caterpillars. Uh, they can still be pretty, but we can do this. How do you add caterpillars to landscapes? Well, you do that by adding the plants that support those caterpillars. And that seems pretty easy, but there is a catch. And that catch is that most plants do not support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which ones we're choosing. And we have to be fussy about which, which plants we're choosing because the caterpillars themselves are fussy. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. You can have all the crepe myrtle and all the boxwood and all the burning bush and all the hostas and, and all the ginkgos and Norway maples, all the plants that we typically landscape with uh, from other countries in your yard and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's gonna create a new monarch butterfly is milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization. It turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? Because the plants have made them that way. Plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they blow to their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those, those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists, and they can only eat the plants with which they have an evolutionary history where they've been able to develop specialized adaptations that allow them to get around those chemical defenses. They develop specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. But again, it takes a long period of history with the, the plant lineage for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do fall into place, uh, the insects locked in into the, the just the one or two plant lineages that it's specialized on. And that's why when we take the milkweed out of our yards, the monarch is not gonna start eating your, your hosta. It's locked into milkweed and the only, it's only option at that point is to go somewhere else, somewhere else or die. And it's why we, when we bring in plants from other continents, most of our insects are not adapted to eating those plants at all. Uh, so food webs, wherever we use these plants in abundance collapse, and wherever those plants escape our yards and become serious invasive species, we're also really hammering those, those uh, food webs. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to reconstruct uh, viable ecosystems, uh, we have to have viable food webs uh, or it's not gonna work. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how well it does work when we do choose the right plants. And I'm gonna start with uh, my house right here in, in Oxford, Pennsylvania. 
I should say our house. This is uh, where my wife, Cindy, and I live. This is what it looked like when we, we moved in. Uh, we got part of a farm, uh, 10 acres of a farm that was broken up. Um, it was a very old farm. It had been farmed almost 300 years. And the last thing they did before they sold the farm off was to mow it for hay. So, you know, practically no plants there. And our goal was to, to restore the, the uh, you know, we'll do the best we could to bring back biodiversity to this particular piece of Southeast Pennsylvania. And in, only, in order to do that, you have to rebuild the food web starting with those caterpillars. Uh, so here's some examples of, of uh, the caterpillars that we attracted to our yard. I wanted to see if I could get the Canadian owlet to be breeding at our house. I'd never even seen a Canadian owlet. That's what the caterpillar looks like. That's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Well, to have Canadian owlets, you have to have meadow root. And we didn't have any meadow root. Meadow root is the only plant they eat, host plant specialization. Now, there used to be meadow rue here, but it was hundreds of years ago. The whole place was farmed to death. No meadow rue anywhere around that I can find. So I got some seeds from someplace and planted it. It grew very nicely. But this was early on, and I had very little faith that the Canadian owlets would be able to find my, my meadow rue. I had no idea where they'd be coming from. So I didn't even go out and check it after I planted it for uh, at least two months. But then I did walk by for some other reason, and it was covered with Canadian owlets. They had found it right away. I'm still Im impressed with that. Um, so now we have a good population of meadow root and Canadian owlets at our house. We've added two species to our little ecosystem. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. Uh, this, this beautiful yellow moth actually has nothing to do with goldenrod. That's a misnomer. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa, ditch daisy. I did know where there was some ditch daisy in a, a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. It, excuse me, it took a year for the, uh, the goldenrod stowaway to find my Bidens, but it finally did. And now we have a good population of both of those. So now we've added four species to the property. Wanted the hackberry emperor at our house, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs here. It's one of the species that ought to be here. Well, as its name suggests, it's a specialist on, on hackberry, on celtus. We didn't have any hackberry, so I planted it. I had to wait four years for the butterflies to find our hackberry, but now we have a good population. I checked one of our hackberry uh, branches in June. There were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on a single branch. <clears throat> so now we've added six species, and that's how it went. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the Arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Now, this is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. That's what its caterpillars look like. I don't know why it hasn't found our, our goldenrod. Uh, but th it turns out this is part of the fun. This is, this is anticipation. It's like waiting for the, the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and I check my goldenrod waiting to, to find these caterpillars. One of these years I'm gonna find them and that'll be a, a great year. Planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I know uh, some people don't like Virginia creeper. I just don't know why. It's a good native plant. It's actually a great native plant. It's got good fall color. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It's a good ground cover. It makes valuable berries for the birds in the fall. They're very high in fat. It's an excellent pollinator plant, believe it or not. The flowers are small and inconspicuous, and you don't even know they're there until you see this cloud of bees around them. Remember, when you're planting a, a pollinator garden, you're planting it for the pollinators, or at least primarily for the pollinators. So even if the flower is not big and showy, you can put it out there. And it turns out that Virginia creeper is the best source of, of uh, food for the large sphinx moths that are the primary part of the uh, nestling diet for cardinals. So things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx are all on Virginia creeper. Wanted to see if I get the double tooth prominent at our house, uh, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you gotta like this guy. It's a specialist on elm. And we didn't have any elm, particularly American elm. You know, the Dutch elm disease took out our, our elms, but there are two big elms at the University of Delaware that did not die. And every year they make a lot of seed. And they got some of that seeds, planted them at home. Elms grow really, really fast, really nice. So that was 19 years ago. Those elms are 80 feet tall now. Brought in the double tooth prominent right away. Another big success. American elm. Wanted the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. 
Well, believe it or not, we didn't have any evening, evening primrose, Enothera, so I planted that. The moths came, they spend the day with their heads stuffed in the flowers, they're very cute. And I planted lots of oak trees. Um, now, these are just examples of the, the plants that I put back at our house, but I wanna focus on oaks for a while because they're such important plants. You might recognize this as the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old, it's enormous. And for some people, that's a problem. I hear people say, I'm not gonna plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your, your local ecosystem, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or as two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to attract the moths, the caterpillars that uh, are helping to rebuild the food web at our, our house. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange pat smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on our property and they come right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves, very first year. And here is a, 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 a caterpillar, crocus geometer, standing on the ground, eating the leaves of that tree. So you don't have to wait hundreds of years or even decades for your oaks to start to contribute. They contribute right away. This is a, a shot of our house from the same place I took that first picture. Uh, pretty much what it looks like today, although the leaves are down at this point. Uh, we've got a little lawn here. We're very traditional. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, we put a lot of plants back. And I noticed right away that um, as we put the plants back, the biodiversity around us started to accumulate very quickly. And four years ago, I made it a goal to try to take a picture of every species of moth that is now making a living at, at our house. Big job. And I'm still at it but I'm up to 1,140 species of moths that I have photos of. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. So that's, that's at least another 40 species right there uh, that are making a living on our 10 acres. Now we do have 10 acres, but Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the landmass of Pennsylvania, we have 44% of all the moth species that occur in Pennsylvania. And we have them because we put the plants back. And because so many of these species are types of bird food, we have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline that we saw last year. The World Wildlife Fund says that uh, we have lost two thirds of the wildlife uh, from planet Earth since 1970. It's pretty depressing to, to hear that, but I'm thinking not at our house. I am sure we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds and it didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. All we did was put the plants back. So don't give up, don't give up folks. Well, you know, if we, there's a lot of us, if we put the plants back in those places where we take them out, we can return an awful lot of the life to the areas around us. But I know what you're thinking. We have 10 acres, a lot of people don't have that much land. Will it work on smaller plots in suburbia? And that is a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri, uh, where they have 0.6 acres. That's 18 times less land than, than Cindy and I have. Uh, and they're in the middle of a suburban neighborhood. All their, their uh, neighbors have the big lawns. When they moved in, their, their yard was choked with bush honeysuckle, amur honeysuckle. So the first thing they did was get rid of that. And then they put in 75 species of native plants, uh, including a, a uh, little water feature uh, they call a bubbler for the birds. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their yard. They're up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. If any of you are, are birders, you know that 35 warblers uh, is, is that's a good number. Just to compare with our house, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. So does it work on smaller uh, plots? Yes, it does. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, that little gray 
tower back there. That's that's O'Hare Airport right over there. Penn has one tenth of an acre, uh, and she's not connected to any natural area at all. One tenth of an acre is three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. Kennedy Expressways over here. She's a little island uh, of habitat. It's a pretty island, but uh, it's little. So she did the same thing. She got rid of her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, including a water feature. Then she sat back and started to count the, the birds that are using her yard. And she's up to 120 species that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house, sitting right there. Okay, there are four things we need to think about if we're gonna succeed in a big way. We do wanna succeed in a big way. And one of the most important of those things is we've got to reduce the area that we have in lawn. We've got uh, at least 40 million acres of, of lawn, the size of New England, and in, it's an ecological deadscape. And that's a 2005 statistic. So you know we have, have more than that. And I know we need lawn to advertise um, our, our status, advertise what good citizens we are. And I know we need lawn to display our Halloween decorations. Um, but what if we cut the area of lawn in half in the US? What if we took areas like this and converted them to this? I got this picture just the other day from um, Dan Gitman in Missouri. This was a big lawn and he's taking it out bit by bit, putting in a whole lot of, of native plants. Well, if we did that on 40 million, half of 40 million acres, that's 20 million acres that we could put towards conservation. And if we do that at home, we can create a new national park that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And it will be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than, than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park will be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home or at least some part of nature at home? We get the opportunity to interact with mother nature, to develop a personal relationship with mother nature at our own time, our own, own pace. All we have to do is go outside. We can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, last summer there were 375 million people in our national parks. So what you're really going to in a lot of cases, unfortunately, is a parking lot. It's also free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone, which I think is essential if you're going to develop that personal relationship, not mediated by somebody else. And this is particularly important for our kids. Why? Because our kids are, are the future stewards of the planet. Uh, and Richard Lou says they're suffering from nature deficit disorder. So we're trying. We get, uh, we get 30 kids, put them on a bus with a teacher. They drive for an hour, walk around a natural area. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back on the bus and, and they drive home. And that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of, of nature right at home, all they have to do is go outside and get to know it alone. No parental supervision. They'll come home. I guarantee it. And in the meantime, they'll, they'll develop that personal relationship, which is essential because our future, our kids are the future stewards of the planet. If they don't know what they're stewarding, if they don't know why they're stewarding it, if they don't know how to steward, if they don't love stewarding the planet, they're going to be lousy stewards. And we can't afford any more lousy stewardship. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature. It's a little piece of grass with a hedge, but there are anole lizards there. And when she discovered that, she sent me this picture to describe how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards don't see you coming. And then you crawl very slowly towards the lizard. No smiling, this is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium to learn how to take care of the lizard, you develop that personal relationship with that part of the natural world. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be catching lizards on the ground in her best dress the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture, so who knows. But I guarantee she's going to remember 
catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I also guarantee she's going to be a good steward of the planet because of it. If you want to do more than catch lizards, uh, get uh, this book, Nancy Stranissi's Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of how to expose your kids to, to nature right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can do that now. Go to our, our website, homegrownnationalpark.org, uh, and get yourself on the map. In other words, you're going to, you're going to um, put in your location and the amount of area that you are uh, planting with natives, the amount of that lawn that you're converting, or, or, or an area you already have protected. Um, we want everybody involved here. Uh, and then your little piece of your county is going to light up with a, a firefly. We're, we're uh, getting new map developers that will uh, allow everybody who's on the map to, uh, it'll be visible all the time, not just when you click on your, your county. And we'll get to see biological carters forming. Um, this is our attempt at, at social media to, to get the message that everybody, not just the tree huggers, everybody is responsible for good earth stewardship. And we want that to spread throughout the country get that new 20 million acre national park built. And by the way, it's free and no, we're not using your data. What would we use it for? And I certainly wouldn't know how to use it. I don't even know what my password is. All right, we're gonna get on the map. We're going to shrink the lawn. Um, what plants are we gonna put in, in the areas that we take out of lawn? I'm gonna argue that some of those have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember the Roman arch, there's the arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they're making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So it, when you're building your ecological house outside, uh, think of the keystone plants as the two by fours that are holding that house up. They're essential. They're the structure that's going to hold up that, that food web. Uh, we can't build a house out of wallpaper. That's what we've been trying to do in the, in the past. Now, they're not the only thing you're building your ecological house out of, but um, they're an essential part of it. So the question is no longer simply, are natives better than, than non-natives ecologically? On average, they certainly are. But there are a lot of natives that aren't producing all that much, too, so the question really is, do we want the most powerful native species um, supporting our, our pollinators and our caterpillars or not? I used to get an email from, from uh, more than one person uh, saying, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia, uh, actually grew in North America 7 million years ago. That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not going to have that argument because that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're doing anything or not. I don't care if ginkgos grew on the moon 7 million years ago. Uh, they produce zero caterpillars here today, and that is the important metric. They're not contributing to our local food web. They're there taking up space. What is contributing more than anything? Uh, to our local food webs, it's one of the oaks. In 84% of the counties, oaks are the, the best keystone plant you can have in your yard. 557 species are supported by oaks in the mid-Atlantic states, and that includes New York, and over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. If you want to find out what the keystone uh, species are where you live, go to uh, Native Plant Finder, the National Wildlife uh, Federation website, or Keystone Plants by Ecoregion. This is a, a new website that, that we're building. Um, and uh, so you either put in your zip code and the ranked list of, of uh, woody and herbaceous plants will pop up, or you put in, uh, you, you, you uh, look at the map and figure out what ecoregion you're in. And the the ranked plants for that ecoregion will, will pop up. Uh, so here are the woodies over here, and this is just examples of what you'll see. The lists are much longer than this. Um, oaks, again, are almost always number one. Native cherries are high, willows are high, blueberries, birches. Um, notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows. If I go to the nursery and say, I wanna buy a cherry, undoubtedly they're gonna sell me an ornamental cherry from Asia. If I wanna buy a willow, they'll sell me a, a weeping willow from, from Turkey. If I want to buy a birch, it'll probably be a European birch. You've got to specialize 
uh, or specified that you want a native member of these important genera. Because if you don't, you're going to reduce caterpillar use by 68%. We've done that experiment. These are the top herbaceous uh, plants, both in terms of making caterpillars, solid, uh, goldenrods, for example, support 110 species of caterpillars, but also in terms of supporting the specialist bees. Uh, that are so important in our, as, as pollinators. We want to support the specialist bees because the generalists can use the plants that the specialists specialize on as well. If you only plant for generalists, you lose the specialists. So if you have goldenrods, asters, and, and perennial sunflowers in your yard, you can have over 44 species of specialist bees uh, that, that are possibly nesting in your yard. And if you don't have those plants, you won't have those bees. So this is what ecoregion number one looks like. It's way too generalized and we're moving into ecoregion number two. Um, so I wouldn't use this, this part of the website yet. Wait, wait till we get this, this fixed and then you'll be, it can be a little bit more specific. This is what ecoregion number two looks like and you'll be able to pick out uh, your area a little bit more accurately. Okay, we are going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to invite a lot of, of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light. And that, of course, is not the goal. There's a lot of research coming out, particularly from Europe, which is pretty convincing in, in making the argument that it's light pollution at night that is uh, one of the major causes of insect decline. And these are all the ways that lights kill our, our insects, particularly the moths that are creating those all-important caterpillars. The, to me, this is good news believe it or not. We have got to stop insect decline. We've already lost 45% of the insects on the planet. Uh, and remember, they're the little things that are keeping us alive. If we can turn that around by simply turning, flicking a switch, turning off those lights at night, we're getting off easy. But I know what you're going to say. I can't turn the light off over my garage or my front porch light uh, because uh, the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on that light so that it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna, gonna realize is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't wanna do that, take the white bulb out of your, your uh, security light and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED is the best because yellow well wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects than are the white wavelengths. If we were to switch out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs in our security lights, overnight we would save millions of insects uh, and also millions of dollars because LEDs, of course, are a lot more energy efficient. Okay, we're going to we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to turn out our lights. Then we're going to invite Mosquito Joe to come and and kill all of our insects. We have no shortage of ways we're going to kill our our insects. This is a booming business around around the country. And Mosquito Joe says it's it's okay because. It's a natural product. It's pyrethrums, and, and it is natural. You know, it's the same compounds that are found in chrys uh, chrysanthemums. But cyanide is a natural product too. So I don't think that's a good argument. He also says it only kills mosquitoes. And I wish he was right. I really do. I don't know if you saw the headlines, not this fall, but the last fall. Big monarch kills when they flew through Mosquito Joe's fog here. Hundreds of monarchs dead on the ground. This stuff kills all the insects it comes in contact with. The big thing is it doesn't work. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You control them in the larval stage. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of the adult mosquitoes. Mos Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50%. So he's not even close to being effective, which means he has to keep coming back, which means you have to keep paying him. Uh, and you're really paying him just to hit non-target insects. If you really want to kill mosquitoes, uh, try mosquito dunks. Get a bucket. Right away, people say, how big a bucket? I don't care. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay, and let it ferment for a couple of times. Of course, we're talking about the, the warm parts of the year. What you're doing is building up populations of algae and diatoms, and that's what the mosquito larvae eat. Uh, and uh, after that is done, a couple of days after you, you put the, the straw or hay in, put in a uh, disc of mosquito dunk. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. You get it at the hardware store. It's a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is mosquito larva. So you put one in, the mosquito larvae eat it, and they die. And only 
the mosquito larvae jar. If a, if a dragonfly larva gets in there, it doesn't hurt it. If your dog drinks it or bird drinks it, it doesn't hurt it at all. You might put a coarse screen over your bucket so that you don't drown your, your local uh, chipmunk. But um, this is a targeted, very cheap way to kill an awful lot of mosquitoes. And if everybody did it, we'd really control those mosquitoes. <coughs> Excuse me. Fourth thing we need to do is to create landscapes that allow our caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania. So this is just an example um, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. Caterpillar eats the leaves, spins a cocoon, uh, and hangs from one of the branches, and then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all again. Everything happens on the tree. And I wish everything did that, but most species don't. 480 of those species, 94% of them, finish growing as caterpillars on the tree, but then they drop from the tree. And they pupate underground, they wiggle their way under the ground when it's loose enough to do that and form a pupa, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There isn't a leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. And we mow and compact the soil all around our trees so it's rock hard and it's almost impossible for those caterpillars to get underground. Which means the way we landscape becomes an ecological trap. We call in the adults to lay their eggs, the caterpillars grow, then they drop down and die. And I am convinced that the way we landscape without proper habitat underneath our trees is another major cause of insect declines around the country. And of course, the cement landscape is even less of a viable option. This is what most people do. You got a tree in a yard, um, you know, with a lot of a lot of lawn. We're just starting to measure how well the uh, caterpillars do in a situation like this. But I guarantee they do better in a situation like this, where you have a tree, then you have a, a layered landscape, maybe a dogwood here, a native azalea, and ferns, and ground cover. This is a safe site. The caterpillars can drop down, the soil is not compacted, they can easily get underground, plenty of leaf litter under here for them to spin their cocoons in. Nobody's gonna mow them, nobody's gonna step on them. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. You don't have to give up gardening to, to, to help nature. As a matter of fact, uh, this is how you shrink your lawn. You can do a lot more gardening. You, you replace that, that meaningless lawn and, and put in uh, important plants. And these all become safe sites for those caterpillars. Your tree will love it, by the way. A good place to use uh, natural ground covers like uh, wild ginger or, or uh, uh, may apple or foam flowers, ferns. This is a, a uh, hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maple trees. Any caterpillar developing on these trees will, will drop down and be able to complete their development in this fern bank under the trees, even though it's the middle of a city. So we can do a lot better in terms of caterpillar survivorship by thinking about the ground cover underneath our trees. Another grad student, Desiree Narango, uh, has done some wonderful work with Carolina Chickadee in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And the, her results suggest there's actually room for compromise in our plant choices. She asked a very simple question. How well do chickadee populations do over time in suburban landscapes that are dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by typical introduced ornamental plants? And the first thing she found is that in the landscapes dominated by, by introduced plants, there were 75% fewer caterpillars. So, so the amount of bird food available is reduced by 75%. Those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Now, each one, each one of these lots has a, a, a birdhouse, a nest box up in it, but the chickadees would come and they'd look around and say, well, there's, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try to breed. If they did try to breed, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. The nest produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And if you put all that into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of uh, woody non-native plant biomass in, in your yard, this is what it looks like from none to 100%. We chose woody, woody plant biomass because uh, chickadees forage on woody plants. So this is a, this dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. Chickadees don't live very long. 
Uh, and if you reproduce at this rate, you have uh, a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. Uh, so it is sustainable. If you make more babies than adults die, you've got a growing population. If you make fewer babies down, down below the line, you've got a shrinking unsustainable population. Right here is where those lines uh, intersect. So very generously speaking, you can have up to 30% of the woody plant biomass in your yard, non-native, without destroying the local food web. Now you can't have any of those be invasive plants because invasive plants invade. Uh, they, they are ecological tumors that escape and cause a lot of problems in our natural areas. But you can have the ginkgo, you can have, uh, you can have your azaleas, you can have your, your camellias, your boxwoods, all those things that behave themselves uh, without destroying the local food web, as long as you get 70% of the plant biomass in your yard native. So that's that area of compromise that, that I'm talking about, which I think is really valuable because if my message was you can't have any non-native plants at all, very few people would be listening. We love our non-native plants. Remember Don Getman's uh, yard here? There's a ginkgo right there. His wife loved a ginkgo and insisted that he put one in. So he did. Does that ginkgo destroy this landscape? No, it doesn't. It's, and it's certainly not, uh, it's just a tiny percentage of the, the plant biomass. Compromise. Remember, it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of native plants. So if we increase the percentage of, of these native plants in our yard, we can tolerate more of these non-natives. Can we use uh, native plants in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design. Um, you don't get more formal than that. That's taken from a drone 400 feet up. It's a big garden, but every single plant in that garden is a native plant. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a traditional suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, just put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells people this is not just a patch of weeds you forgot to mow. It services a, a lot of bees. Could be bigger, but if everybody did it, um, it would be, be uh, nice and functional. And certainly when they're in bloom, it's, it's nice and pretty. Let's remember why we need pollinators. You hear all the time you need them because they're pollinating a third of our crops. That's actually about a 12th of our crops. And I hear people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Forget the, the crop argument. You need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of our, our flowering plants. Not an option. It's just not an option. Where do we need plants? Or where do we need pollinators? Everywhere where we need plants, which is everywhere. What about this? this? is a Drew Latham design, much bigger. Imagine the amount of life here versus the amount of life that is, that is here. This seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has a cost-sharing program where the state helps uh, homeowners reduce or totally replace their lawns with appropriate Minnesota uh, prairie plants. Very popular programs called the Lawn to Legume Program. Pennsylvania has a new, new uh, lawn conversion program. It's only two years old, but you get up to $5,000 per acre of lawn that you replace with, with native plants. Catching on very quickly. There's an island off of Florida that uh, is paying people to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. So if you have an endangered species on your property, we're going to pay you to take care of it, to be a good steward of it, rather than fine you if you do something with your property. Everybody would want an endangered species on their property. Some places like uh, St. Louis, Missouri, or Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I just heard South Carolina too, I think, is, is, uh, has a bounty on calorie pears. You take out a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. And even public utilities are getting into the act, giving people $100 coupons here in Texas to plant water efficient native species as opposed to uh, the non-natives that waste a lot of our water. And then of course the lawn conversion programs in California, up to $2 per square foot rebate, by uh, taking out uh, your thirsty lawn. Cali California doesn't have a single drop of water that it can waste on, on lawn. And then replacing it with appropriate xeric plantings. 
I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first one's a serious one. We've come to think of nature as being optional. We like it. We like to visit it. We like to watch it. Uh, but it's, it's not essential. And if it's not essential, when, when resources are in short supply, when push comes to shove, uh, then nature takes a back seat. And that's all the time. Resources are always in, in short supply. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out, and there's this wall-sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of, of conservation. We want to save wildlife, save nature, so that future generations can enjoy it. And I get that. And that was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. We want to save these wonderful places so that future generations can enjoy them. But to me, that suggests, again, nature's there just for entertainment. No wonder we don't think it's essential. It is essential. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we talked about this, but if, if we restrict our conservation efforts just to the areas that don't have a lot of humans in them, we're gonna fail because those, those areas will be too small, too few and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature we need to create the amount of ecosystem services we need. David Quammen has a, a wonderful analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug <clears throat> that is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that, of course, is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that terminology because it suggests that there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, our roadsides, even much of our agriculture. <clears throat> so we need to put the plants back. We need to glue our rug back together again, folks, not just to build biological carters that connect uh, viable habitat, but to, to build viable habitat where we've completely destroyed it, where we live, where we work, where we farm, where we play. When we do this, it'll be the first time in modern history that we are coexisting with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship just to a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, few ecologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. But I don't know why, because everybody in the planet depends entirely on the quality of, of uh, their local ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody be responsible for good Earth stewardship to protect those ecosystems? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. Mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you've taught them. And we've been good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. Not, not just the tree huggers, not just the people who like nature, but everybody on the planet. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And when you do, it empowers you. So many people feel powerless today. The earth's problems are huge. They say, what can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn. One person can put in keystone plants. One person can put in a pollinator garden. One person can turn out their lights. One person can remove the invasive plants from their property. We didn't even talk about that. One person can totally revitalize the, the, the ecosystem uh, that exists on their yard. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for everybody. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You'll get depressed. Just think about your piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, that's obvious. That's where you, you focus. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy. Help a park. Help a preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate and then ultimately our, our own fate. And I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Doug. That was wonderful. I think you've given us a lot to think about. Um, so before we dive into the q and I just want to say it sounds like a number of people were having difficulties logging in. 
So uh -oh. we did send out a link partway through that hopefully worked for most people. So for anyone who missed part of the webinar, it, is, it has been recorded. And so we'll be posting it on our website soon. And we will be sending out a follow-up email as well to thank you all for attending and also provide a list of resources, including a list of Doug's books and some of the resources that he mentioned during the webinar. So look for that email in the next couple of days. I am going to, to get a quick drink of water before I choke here. I'll be right back. All right. And in the meantime, let me look. There's a couple questions in the chat asking if it's OK to share the recording with others. And yes, that's absolutely OK. We'll have it up on our DLC website soon on a YouTube channel. And so that's certainly something we're hoping will be widely shared. I think I know there's an environmental science class that is tuning in tonight, and we're hoping that this will be the basis of a lot of great conversations and, and widely shared among the audience. OK, back in business. OK. So one question is, how do we factor climate change into planning for native plants over the long term? Depends on what you mean by, by long term. But my immediate suggestion is don't factor it in at all. Because the climate is not very slowly warming evenly. What's happening is uh, the climate is becoming more variable. So we have big spikes. We have hotter, hotter summers or hotter periods. But we also have colder times. Look at that, that uh, frost, that deep breeze in Texas last year. They went all the way down to Mexico in February. Um, so we're getting much more climate variability, and that's what our plants have to deal with. If we, if we, a lot of people are suggesting we move southern plants up to, uh, you know, be ready for a warmer climate, but they're not going to make it be, uh, as long as we have this extreme variability. So let's just uh, hope that we have enough genetic variability in the plants where they are right now, so that they can uh, adapt to what we're throwing at them. All right, thank you, and. Let's get started in the Q&A. So we have someone who is worried about the timing for cutting a meadow. So what do you recommend as the timing and height for cutting down a meadow without affecting the insect population? OK. Um, well, first of all, any cutting you do should happen in early spring. So as soon as you can get out to your meadow when it's you know, the snow's gone and it's, and it's not too wet, that's when you should cut. But the, the real key here is that you should only cut one third of your meadow each year. Two thirds should be left un, untouched because the area you cut or the area you burn, you're gonna kill the insects. Uh, it's, it's, you just, there's no way around it. And if you do the entire thing, then they have to recolonize from someplace else. If you only do a third and a third and a third each year, each place only gets treated once every three years. Uh, and the two thirds you don't treat will recolonize the area you did treat. In the meantime, any, you know, the, in, in this part of the world, woody plants want to come into our meadows. So you can spot treat them anytime. But in terms of the, you know, the, the broad scale mowing or burning, one third at a time. When you do cut, if you have the option, you want to cut as high as you can. Um, we have, well, it has been found, I haven't found it, but that uh, many native bees will overwinter in the stalks from the previous year in the bottom, maybe you know, 12, 15 inches. So when the tops are gone, that's okay. They'll use the bottom, bottom part. I don't know of any mower that you can set 15 inches high, but uh, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> if you can do it, that's what you should do. All right, now I have a question about the caterpillars. I think this person was as fascinated as I was by all the photos that you had. So when you're looking for those caterpillars and moths, what time of day do you look for them? You will find the most if you look at night, actually. Remember, the birds are trying to find them too. And the caterpillars are very good at hiding. Uh, and they're much better hiding it from you than they are at hiding from, from the birds. So they're cryptic. You can develop search images. Uh, you always want to look on the underside of the leaf because that's where most of them are hiding. But a lot of them crawl off the leaves, they're on the stems, the trunk, or even off the tree entirely during the day. And then they climb back up at night. It is far easier to go out with a flashlight at night and find caterpillars. Also, the time of year is important because in the, in the springtime, particularly end of May and June, the birds have eaten most of them. <laughs> so it's hard. That's the worst time to look for, for caterpillars. 
The best time is maybe the end of July, early August, when populations are pretty high again. Uh, so looking at night at the end of July, you're going to have the most success. Okay, that's good to know. And I am definitely going to be trying that next year. Now, here's a question that I think a lot of landowners in our area have. This is someone who has a lot of deer pressure in the woods. And as a result, the seedlings of native trees and shrubs get eaten. So there's very little understory. Um, shrubs like barberry do not get eaten. So what do you recommend to encourage the understory in the forest to come back? I recommend the obvious thing. We have to reduce our deer populations. We have to reduce our deer populations to fight Lyme disease, to encourage recruitment into the forest, and to, to put a crimp on those invasive species. Many of these non-native plants are invasive only because the deer tip the competitive balance. They eat the natives and don't eat the barberry or the burning bush or the autumn olive or all of those guys. So no wonder they have a competitive advantage. Um, so this becomes a sociological problem now, not an ecological one. We know we have too many deer or the other alternative is, is to put uh, the, the predators back. Fine with me, bring back the cougars, bring back the wolves and, and that will help too. Uh, but if we don't do that, we have to be the predators ourselves. Those are the only, the only options. Do you have any advice on the use of fencing to exclude deer from areas that might encourage understory growth? Yeah, that works, but it's very expensive. Yeah. It takes a lot of upkeep uh, and, and we can't fence the world. We don't wanna lose our forests. Uh, we can fence little, little areas and sure, that works. You know what I do? I don't, I don't fence the entire property, but when I put in a tree or a shrub that I want to protect, I do put a five foot galvanized fence around it until it is big enough that the deer can't, can't kill it. Uh, at that point, though, you still want to protect it from buck rubbing. They'll sharpen their antlers on it or get the, the velvet off of them and rub the bark right off your, your young trees. And after, you know, you've worked hard to get the tree to be 15 years old, and then the buck comes and kills it. So what I do is take one, one little wrap of uh, old plastic deer fencing just one time around you know, for a couple of feet, and that discourages the, the bucks. They don't like that. Okay, that sounds like good advice. Now here's someone who's asking about fruit trees. They're popular in urban areas, but can attract a lot of pests. So what natives can we plant to attract the parasitoids or wasps and spiders to control those pests? So you're gonna put the natives with the, the fruit trees? Is that, that it? I think that's what he's asking, yeah. Okay. Um, all the natives will do that. <laughs> Uh, again, you know, if you want the biggest variety of natural enemies, oaks are going to provide more than anything else. Black cherries, another great, great choice. Your hickories and your, your, your birches, even black walnuts, very good in bringing in uh, natural enemies. Uh, so, for example, I've got, when we grow tomatoes at our house, we get tomato hornworm just like everybody else. It's really tobacco hornworm at our house. Uh, and, and you might see those little white cocoons on the back. People think they're eggs. Those are really braconid wasps that have, have uh, completed their development as larvae inside the caterpillar. And then they crawl out through the integument and spin a cocoon on the outside. So they've essentially already killed the caterpillar. He's not eating much at that point. That's a natural enemy that attacks sphinx moths. But if you, the only sphinx moth you have in your property is your tobacco hornworm, they're not going to come. Now, our house, we've got 17 species of sphinx moths because of the various types of, of uh, plants that support other species of sphinx moths. Like you know, the Virginia creeper has, what, five or six on there? Um, and, and so there's always braconid parasitoids around, ready to, to jump over when we get the tobacco horn. That's an example of having a, a good population of natural enemies that will then, excuse me, spill over onto anything that, that you're growing agriculturally. Okay. And on the topic of planting native trees and plants, um, someone's asking uh, what to do when they're not always readily available locally. Can you recommend any online sources that sell plugs or smaller sizes of plants and trees? Yeah, this can be a problem, has, bigger, has been a bigger problem in the past. Uh, I know the National Wildlife Federation, one of the things they want to put on their website are local sources by county of people that are selling uh, these plants. At this point, the demand is outstripping the supply. 
but that's what stimulates the supply. More and more growers are, are increasing uh, what they carry. Um, so I'm hoping that this is less of a problem in the future. There are uh, a number of, of places that will ship plants. Uh, so Prairie Nursery, Prairie Noon Nursery in, where are they, Minnesota or Wisconsin? I think it's Minnesota. Um, Ernst Seed is much closer in, in uh, Pennsylvania. They also ship uh, plugs and things. Um, you know, I don't know. I know there are places in New York State, and I just don't, don't know what they are. Uh, but even these places that are fairly far away will carry stock that uh, has local genetic provenance. You, you want to get stock that is genetically adapted to your particular area. So you tell them where you live uh, and, and they'll do the best they can to, to match your provenance. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the very best though is to have somebody who's really local. Right. Uh, and and, and there sure. are some places, so. Yeah, and I'm not sure where this person is located, but if you are in Dutchess County, I would definitely recommend the Dutchess County Soil and Water Conservation District's plant sale. They sell seedlings every spring and they really do focus on native species. So okay. if you are local, look that up in the springtime. Okay, now here's a question about lawn maintenance. So many homeowners use landscape, landscapers who strip the yard of what they call weeds and leave a desert behind. How can we get landscapers involved in getting natives out there? Well, you could interview them before you hire them. Remember, they're working for you. You are not working for them. People say, my landscaper won't do it. Well, if you really won't do it, fire them. Find somebody who does do it. I mean, we're trying to train, create, I mean, there is an empty niche of ecological landscapers out there. Most of these people have not been trained uh, and we're trying to fill that niche, but it's, it's, it's slow going. But uh, again, the demand is outstripping the supply. A lot of people, every place I go, people want to hire somebody who's going to do what I say. There are a few people putting out their shingles, you know, ecological landscapers or ecological gardening. Um, and, you know, just look for them. That, that, uh, that business will stimulate more people going, going into it. But uh, just your... <laughs> Your landscaper will do what you tell them to do because again, they are working for you. If you say no, no volcano mulch, then no volcano mulch. If you're, you know, don't blow all the leaves around from underneath my tree. Um, and if they do say, okay, you guys are not listening to me, you're gone. They will listen to you. Okay. And in the meantime, there've been a couple more suggestions typed into the chat about um, sources of native plants. Um, the DEC also has native plants and locally the Catskill Native Nursery is a good source for, for native plants. All right, you mentioned mosquito control. What controls do you recommend to minimize ticks? Does attracting more birds help? Uh, um, well, you know, the deer tick wasn't a problem when, when deer were not over their carrying capacity. I grew up, you know, and we never even knew what a deer tick was, never saw one. They were here, but the numbers were so low that we never encountered them. There was no Lyme disease. Uh, again, it must have been around, but so infrequent, we didn't even see it. Then we allowed deer to get several times over the carrying capacity. Uh, and it's the perfect storm in terms of creating high levels of infectivity. Now, the Cary Institute, as you know, has shown that when you have a diverse landscape and many other types of mammals around, uh, including possums and raccoons and foxes and other things that are, are actually, the ticks will get on them, but they're a poor host for Lyme disease. Uh, it reduces infectivity rates uh, when it comes to humans. When you have a very simplified landscape, which is deer, white-footed mice and humans, infectivity rates are high. So having a diverse landscape with other mammals uh, reduces the, the, the chances of, of getting Lyme disease, but also being cognizant of when infectivity rates are the highest, which uh, at least where I live, it's, it's May, uh, May and then drops off a little bit in June. Um, now you can always get it, but it, it really, it peaks in, in May and it gets much lower in other parts of the, the season. You should get good at um, checking yourself <laughs> for, for ticks. I'm very lucky. Uh, well, I've had Lyme disease five times, so I'm not that lucky, but um, I'm lucky because the ticks itch. 
when I get a, a, a deer tick embedded, it doesn't matter how small it is, it itches and that's how I find it. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm not a medical doctor and I'm not allowed to tell you this, but a medical doctor did tell me this, uh, who worked on Lyme disease from University of Pennsylvania. You pull the tick off at that point and put Neosporin on it. It takes several hours for the Borrelia to get into your, your capillaries um, when it, it first is there, which is why you, you don't want it to be there for, you know, 24 hours, 36 hours. You want to pull it off as soon as possible and put the Neosporin on and it kills the Borrelia before it gets into your system. And when I have followed that advice, I have not gotten Lyme disease. It's only when like I had itchy toes when I thought it was athlete's foot. I didn't even check my feet. It was a tick right between my toes. And, and yeah, I got it. But um, so you know, being vigilant, knowing that when you go off the, the mode parts of your yard, uh, the mode paths that are a nice cue for care, by the way, shows your neighbor that you have a planned landscape. And you walk around, particularly grasses and things in May, it's a really good time to pick up ticks. So that's when you, you've got to be very, very vigilant. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a huge problem. It is a problem we've created, though. So It is. And I know locally, the Cary Institute is doing work on this, where they're testing out a couple of different methods of controlling ticks in a, a basic homeowner landscape. Um, and I don't know where they are in terms of results on that. I know it was a long-term study, but if you Google the Tick Project, the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, you can see more about the, the work that they're doing on that. Well, there is a, 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 a cotton ball product, right? With pyrethrins or something in the cotton ball, and then the mice mm -hmm. would take it back and make a nest out of it, and that would kill the ticks on the mice. Mm -hmm. I had heard that worked pretty well. I've never tried yeah. it, but. Yeah. So Doug, we're coming up on 7.30 and to be respectful of people's time, we did say we'd end at 7.30, but I gotta say the more questions we answer, the more questions keep pouring into the Q&A. So would you be willing to stay on a little bit longer sure. and answer some sure. more questions? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so here's someone whose neighbor objects to their compost bin because he thinks the greenhouse gases it emits outweigh the benefit to my yard. Any thoughts on that? Well, I've never heard that one. <laughs> <laughs> How often does your neighbor mow his yard? Because I bet the greenhouse gases he emits with his mower are, are, are beating your, your compost bin. Um, I don't know, Julie, what would you say to that? <laughs> I don't know. I would say some scientific study would be required to quantify <laughs> the greenhouse what, gas what emissions. It, he thinks if you throw it out someplace else, take it to a dump, there's going to be less greenhouse right. gas. I mean, I mean I'm guessing it's just someone who is aware that decomposition does produce some greenhouse gases and sees yeah. that as part of the But problem. that material so will decompose wherever you put it. So right, I would get exactly. some ecological benefit out of it. Right. I, I agree completely. I, I think the neighbor just could perhaps use a little bit of education on <laughs> the realities of You know what? Gas Plant emission. an oak tree, which is going to absorb a whole lot more carbon than your compost heap produces. And you could say you're, you're counterbalancing it with that. Good solution. And actually that leads straight into the next question, which is someone who was wondering if you can suggest oaks for small yards in New York state. Yes, Quercus prinoides is dwarf, uh, dwarf chestnut oak. Oh, uh, I That's the most there commonly was available uh, in the trade for New York. Um, there's dwarf chinkapin oak as well. Uh, in in uh, you know pine barreny type places, you get blackjack oak, which which doesn't get very big. But uh, Quercus prinoides is is great. It'll produce acorns when it's five feet tall, um, wow. so it's it's perfect for a small yard. And what about pin oaks? I know they tend to have a little more of a trim silhouette than some of the sprawly red and white oaks. Yeah, but they get but pretty they, big. They can still I've get got pin oaks. Yeah. The, <laughs> the, that I've planted that are already 50 feet tall. So, wow. Yeah. All right. Now here's someone who has a lot of walnuts that seem to only let spice bush grow. Any suggestions <laughs> on that? Um, that's not really true. Uh, you hear about walnuts having a lilopathy and they don't let other plants grow. Uh, and, and that uh, ericaceous plants, so things like uh, azaleas and rhododendrons do not do well under walnuts. There's no doubt about that. But most other plants do. And, and I can say that from experience. We've got walnuts all over the place because the squirrels keep moving them around. 
and everything's growing underneath them. The reason you only have spice bush is because that's what the deer don't eat. <laughs> they eat everything else. And that's why we have these spice bush monocultures, spice bush and all the invasives. Um, spice bush is a good plant, but it's it's not all that productive. And we want we want a much more varied understory. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't blame your spice bush uh, abundance on walnuts. Okay. Now here's someone who is meeting with a local municipality regarding sustainability in the community. What can you suggest to grab their attention on the importance of natives or maybe literature to hand out? That's why I write the books. <laughs> <laughs> if they don't want to read it, get book on tape. <laughs> you know, these, these arguments about why we need to use natives, particularly in public space, not particularly, but in addition in public spaces and street trees and everything else, they're not sound bites, and and it's easy to dismiss them unless you get the whole story. So so um, that is what I've tried to, to provide. Uh, Nature's best hope is a really good place to start. For, <laughs> uh, and and then then they'll know as much as I do, and it, it ought to convince them. So. Okay, good advice. Advice I intend to take. <laughs> now here's someone who is wondering how many species eastern sycamores support. They have a couple big ones in their yard and very curious about what species might use those leaves. They're good. They're not in the top 10, but they're certainly in the top 20. Uh, I think it's around 80 some species, something like that. So I, I've got sycamores too. I like them. Okay. And of course they're very, you know, they'll grow pretty much anywhere, but they um, do really well in bottom land along rivers and, and things. Uh, they throw a lot of shade. They're sequestering a lot of carbon. They get huge. Now, here's an interesting question. Many climate change focus groups on Facebook are sharing posts urging people to plant bamboo or hemp, Holy which are fast-growing plants to sequester carbon. What can I say to persuade them that native trees and plants are better choices despite being slower growing? Tell them every one of their premises is dead wrong. <laughs> Try that for starters, but you don't want fast growing things because uh, fast growers are, uh, they do not have tightly packed tissues. They're sequestering a lot less carbon than slow growers. And again, I'll turn to oaks they are the best carbon sequesters or, or something like Osage orange. It's extremely dense wood uh, that will sequester a lot more carbon than fast growing things. Fast growers, well, it only matters if you're um, like there's there's hybrid poplars that grow really fast uh, and then they harvest them and use that that biomaterial to create energy. But bamboo, even if it's the best carbon sequester in the world, that is the best way to ruin the property value uh, at your house. It's outlawed in Dover, Delaware. You're going to need a backhoe to get it out before you sell your house. It'll take over your entire property. Your neighbor will sue you. Don't ever plant bamboo. Uh, then so many better choices for carbon sequestration. That's absolutely one of the worst. Okay. Now here's a question about Virginia creeper. You mentioned Virginia creeper as an important vine for several moth species. Some people have decried vines in general and grapevines in particular as pulling down trees and thus being bad for forests. What can I tell these people is the question. <laughs> okay, well, they're not all wrong, but all vines are not created equal. Grapevines uh, get huge. Um, they can easily have, have a girth like this. Grapevines in the old days only grew in light gaps. What we've done now is reverse that where everything is a light gap. So all of the edges and everything is perfect for grapevines and they can uh, get so large and put a lot of weight on trees that they pull it down. That's of course exactly what Oriental Bittersweet does or the Oriental Bittersweet girdles the trees at the same time. So they're worse than grapes, but um, Virginia creeper and poison ivy don't do either one of those. They grow up on the outside of the tree. They have thin, very light vines. They don't, I've never seen a tree pulled down by, by those vines. What I would not do is plant them on your house like I did, <laughs> but all the vines grow really quickly uh, and you don't want them on, on your house. Uh, a fence out, you know, uh, a little bit from the house is, is great. Or an old snag, you plant, plant at the base of a snag and then it covers it. That's a wonderful uh, place for it because it's a valuable plant to have in your yard, but you want it in the right place. 
Um, and and it's, it is incorrect to think that all vines are, are bad in terms of pulling trees down. Porcelain berry, I don't know if you guys have that yet, mm -hmm. but uh, it, is, it is terrible, terrible, terrible because it grows, it, that's the kudzu of the North and it puts so much weight and just grows over everything. So you don't want to tolerate that at all. But Virginia yeah. Creeper's good. <laughs> yeah, we do have some porcelain berry. Bittersweet is really the one that you see draped yeah, over the trees. Terrible. Right here. Yeah. So we have a couple more suggestions on where to find native plants. So the native plant nursery in Pauling, which is in Southern Dutchess County, is mentioned. And also Pinelands Direct in New Jersey. And this person is also suggesting just ask your neighbors on social media. Um, they can provide great resources on native plants. Well, also, you know, every state has a native plant society. So no matter where mm -hmm. you are, they should know where the native plants are sold near you. Yeah. Now, here's an interesting question. Are you familiar with the winter sowing movement that works great for native plants? It's teaching many people how to sow their own seeds so they can go to scale at minimum cost. Um, I understand there are good times to do that. I didn't know there was an actual movement to teach people. So I guess I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, it's not something I'm familiar with either. Now, can you go into the pros and cons of letting meadows self-establish with periodic woody removal versus native species planting that enables invasive persistence? Uh, the benefit is you'll save a lot of money. If you're, if you're planting a, a meadow yourself and you're starting from seed, it's very expensive. Plugs are even more expensive, but you'll get where you wanna go much faster. Um, you can create uh, a natural meadow just with appropriate mowing regimes where you mow heavily in the spring and then stop mowing during the summer. What that does is shift the competitive balance towards warm season bunch grasses uh, and the uh, um, the Forbes will come in, but the way all grass systems around the world evolved with grazers. The reason grasses grow the way they do with the meristem at the base is because grazers were always eating the tops. So that's what grasses do. And now we're trying to make meadows and restore prairies and everything without any grazers. So what actually has used to maintain the ecological conditions that favored plant diversity and that openness, the big grazers, they're gone. So you either put a grazer back, uh, and I would suggest horses as opposed to cattle because horses don't want very rich material. Uh, and people, I don't know, they like horses more than cattle, I guess. Or bison are great. You know, wood bison used to come all the way to the, the Atlantic, so they are appropriate here, uh, but a little harder to manage. If you can bring back the large Pleistocene mammals, they did a lot of grazing and kept things very uh, savanna-like. But in the absence of all those, we have, to, we have to be our own Pleistocene mammals. You have to, um, you, can, you can mimic grazing with a weed whacker, it's patchy. You do a little bit here, a little bit there, and that increases the plant diversity. But if you don't do anything, the grasses typically take over and that's all you have. You, the forbs will drop out. Um, so those are your challenges. Eastern meadows are not easy. Everybody just wants to let their lawn go and make a meadow. It's the hardest thing to do uh, properly because it wants to be a forest. We get a lot of rain and the woodies wanna, wanna mm -hmm. come in, so. Uh, I, you know, we used to have a lot of eastern prairie. We had the heath hen, there were specialists here, but when this, and, and the Native Americans kept it that way with fire, but when the settlers came, it was the very first place they plowed up because they didn't even have to take the trees down. So uh, we've lost most of that and putting it back would be a valuable addition, but it's not particularly easy. Yeah. Now here's a question that I can really get behind. This person is asking, can you publish a kid's version of your book for young readers, grade school reading groups, and adults that won't commit to reading a full book? Well. I love that idea. And so does Timber Press. So they hired a woman, Sarah, somebody whose name I have forgotten, uh, who has finished rewriting Nature's Best Hope for grade school. And I have just finished editing her writing. Uh, and I'm about ready to send it back. So they're going to actually do that. Um, so they didn't ask me to do it. And that's good because they would have had to wait a while. But uh, they, you know, they're, 
I'm sure they think there's a market out there, but it's a it's a you know important information that if we can get to the kids, I think she did a pretty good job talking about how you can convince your parents to do this and do that. Uh, I'm not sure what age group she was targeting. It seems pretty young, but that's okay as long as they don't try to give it to high schools because it's written too young for them. But right. Uh, but well, anyway, well, that's that's just about done. So maybe maybe the end of next year we'll see oh, that. Wow, I am looking forward to that. Now here's a question: What is a good resource on the least toxic herbicides for spot treatment? Oh boy. <clears throat> The problem with the least toxic herbicide is you won't kill your plants. <laughs> and then you have to do it over and over and over again. I don't know of any study that compares toxicity. I, I, I don't, not a big uh, herbicide guy myself. I will, I, will, you, I will paint. I don't ever spray, but I'll cut uh, woodies and, and paint them. Um, but, you know, I don't want to do it six times. So I usually go for something that's gonna actually kill the roots. You wanna kill the roots. Uh, so I manage toxicity by using as little material as possible rather than material that's not very toxic because, because then you'll have to repeat the treatment over and over again. And in the end, you're using the same, same amount of toxicity when you add it all up. Okay, now there's a series of questions this is kind of your your greatest hits list, I think. So someone is interested in shrubs for the understory that deer may leave alone. Another person is interested in suggestions for native non-invasive vines. And what are your top five native trees and shrubs for this area? So if you want, maybe just give a rundown of your, your favorites in all those okay. categories. <laughs> Quickly. Um... You know, shrubs and deer leave alone. We talked about spice bush. They don't. Uh, they don't like pawpaw. They don't. Um, they'll eat uh, uh, witch hazel, but not very much. Well-fed deer leave uh, black cherry alone, but hungry deer eat it. Hungry deer eat hollies. Hungry deer eat anything. Mm -hmm. um, what else? Uh, uh, as it comes to me, I. I'll, I'll blurt them out. I, I don't, you, you don't want to produce a landscape that is deer proof because that's also a landscape that's going to support very few insects. The deer are a very good measure for what the insects like. Whatever the deer love, so do the insects. And, and remember, that's what's really running our, our ecosystems. So a few deer resistant plants are okay, but you don't want to overload your landscape with those. What was, what was another one of my, my top yeah, top tree, trees. Top five trees and shrubs. Top five trees would be any of the any of the oaks, any of the, any of the native prunus, um, any of the hickories, uh, any of the birches. Natives, natives, natives. I'm not talking about non-native because you can get non-natives of all of these. Mm -hmm. um, willows. I keep forgetting willows. Willows are are right there with with cherries in terms of of uh, supporting caterpillars. So they're number two. And the farther north you go, the more willow options you have. Um, that's at least five. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of a follow-up question to something we talked about. Are there any native bamboos? You know, I think there are. The, uh, the cane, you hear about the cane breaks down in the south. I think that's a native bamboo. You're challenging my botanical expertise here, but not in the sense that you think of bamboos. Um, they don't look like the bamboos of the of the Orient, um, and I don't think there's any native bamboos up this far north. You certainly don't want to have have Japanese knotweed, which looks like a, a bamboo. Mm -hmm. But now here's an interesting question, probably from someone in Canada: um, Are there is there a Canadian partner organization that is collaborating or extending the movement of building a homegrown national park within Canada? Um, well, uh, the David Suzuki Foundation, um, is that Toronto, I think? Probably, I think. It was, it was funny. Um, years ago, I was giving a talk with Richard Louvre, and then he went and gave a talk to David Suzuki, and he talked about Homegrown National Park, and David Suzuki said, hey, that's a great idea, and he just started doing Homegrown National Park, and then Richard Louvre said, wait a minute, that's Doug Tallamy's. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so you can look on the web and find Hunger National Park with the Suzuki Foundation, but I think they've abandoned that since. And, and 
but they are, we, we're trying to uh, expand the get on the map uh, option to Canada. It's more difficult because the postal system is, is not the same. Um, uh, so we have a web developer working on that. Uh, but that is an option. And David Suzuki is financially supporting that, that expansion. So I guess the answer to that is yes. Okay. So let's just take one more question. Um, should honeysuckle be removed wherever it's found or left for the pollinators? You know, there's a native honeysuckle, coral honeysuckle, mm -hmm. Lanicera semper virens. That's the only one that should be uh, remain. It's, it's not that the plants are bad, it's that they're invasive. They spread and they push out the natives that support a lot more. So if you leave Japanese honeysuckle, it will spread everywhere. If you leave bush honeysuckle, it replaces the understory. Uh, nothing eats the leaves, particularly bush honeysuckle. Um, yes, it blooms and, and hummingbirds and a few things will use it when it's in bloom, which is like two weeks of the year. The other 50 weeks of the year, it's contributing nothing and has pushed out the plants that contribute a lot. So that's the problem with that. I hear that argument from Privet in the South. It covers millions of acres in the South, literally. And they say, well, it's good for the hummingbees, the honeybees. For one week, it's good for the honeybees. And the rest of the week, it's eliminated all the other blooming plants, which is terrible for the humming, uh, honeybee. I can't talk anymore, I'm sorry. <laughs> So, and there's so uh, you know, think of these non-native invasive plants as ecological tumors. They don't go away. They just get worse and worse and worse. So tolerate them the same way you would tolerate a tumor in your body, which okay. I hope is not at all. And kind of another part to the similar question is, what are your thoughts about replacing grass with clover? Um, you know, that's the way it was in, in the 50s. Our lawns in the 50s all had white clover in it. We do have native clovers, but the clover you buy in the store is white, white clover for the most part. Uh, a lot of things use it. It's not a bad plant at all. It puts nitrogen in the soil. So if you want something that you're going to walk on and you, you don't want it to be grass, clover is a good, a good alternative. Or you just add it to your, your lawn and it'll grow nicely. And when you mow it, um, it just becomes part of that system. And then things like honeybees and, and generalist bumblebees do use it. Uh, but of course, so that's better than your lawn. You can't use any fertilizer on it because the, almost all the, the natural fertilizers, the turf builder and everything, they've got broadleaf herbicides in it. And, and it'll, they're designed to make sure you have nothing but grass in your, in your yard. Um, so... Uh, if you're going to have lawn, put some clover in it, that's fine. Okay. And on that note, let's wrap up. Thank you all for your great questions. Thank you, Doug, for a wonderful presentation. And thank you for sticking around a little bit late to answer the deluge of questions. You've clearly inspired a lot of thought in our audience. You are welcome. All right. Take care, everybody. So thank you all so much. We'll be doing this again on the first Wednesday in January when our speaker will be Heather Holm talking about pollinators.